This is the first time that I have the honor to give a lecture in Hillel Hall after the death of my friend Rabbi Moritz Bekrasky. Permit me to pay homage to his memory. The soul and substance of Rabbi Bekrasky was Jewish piety, simple, old-fashioned, chaste Jewish piety. He de dedicated his life to keeping alive this holy fire or to revive it. He knew very well how difficult this task was in the middle of the 20th century, especially at a university like ours. He acted in this difficult situation with singular tact and prudence. He did not protest against those who tried to reduce Judaism to social ethics on the one hand and to an ethnic culture on the other, since both parties retain a part, however small, of the ancient truths. And since their very antagonism, the antagonism between the universal and the particular, points to the full truth, the chosen people, the people chosen to be witness of for justice. He did not rebuff, nay, he attracted those who were not as blessed as he was, who had not succeeded in finding a way of reconciling the old piety and the new science. For he was united with them in love of truth, this was indeed the limit of his tolerance and forbearance. He just tolerated, for he was a very polite man, those for whom the university is above all a place for promoting themselves. I believe, and after having heard Mr. Anastablo, I know that he would have approved of the effort of Mr. Anastablo and his friends which is to explore how one can secure by human means the future of religion without infringing on the rights of man. I would like to say first a few words about how I plan to approach the subject. I speak, of course, as a social scientist. A social scientist is a man who is sworn to face and pronounce also unpleasant truths, truths unpleasant to himself. There are two kinds of unpleasant truths, unpleasant truths which are at the same time pleasant and simply unpleasant truths. I give an example of both. For example, it is not altogether unpleasant for a friend of big business to point out the vicious, the unpleasant power of the labor union, nor for a friend of the labor unions to point out the unpleasant power of big business. These are pleasant facts for these people, for facts on which they thrive. The truly unpleasant facts are those which render questionable one's party line. For example, like Yalta for the professional liberal and strong central government with a terrific defense budget for the professional conservative. It is this, in this spirit that I approach my subject. What does the tradition of political philosophy teach us regarding religion and the common weal? Voltaire has said, Celui qui nous, qui nous regarde fixement les deux pôles de la vie, la religion et le gouvernement, n'est qu'un lâche. He who doesn't dare to look straight at the two poles of life, religion and government, is only a coward. In the language of our time, the two poles of life are government, the subcultural, and religion, the supracultural. Two stern 
and exacting thing as distinguished from culture. If we understand politics and religion in terms of culture, we obscure the fundamental difficulty. Government, the common weal, is necessarily particular. Religion is, at least according to its intention, universal, embracing all men. But if we look at everything from the point of view of culture, we forget the universal, because culture is something in the, used in the plural. We forget the universal, the truly human, for culture, as the term is now used, is essentially particular. Now, if we were to follow this thought, we might be compelled to question the concept not only of religion, but, uh, or of culture, but even the concept of religion. Religion is not a Hebrew term, nor a Greek term. It stems from Latin. Piety is indeed a universal term. But is religion the same as piety? That's a rather subtle question. When we say, or say of a man he is religious, and when we say he is pious, I think we do not in all cases mean the same thing. For example, I do not believe that everyone ever called Buba pious, whereas he is, of course, a religious man. Uh, but let us not be or appear to be pedantic. Let us say, as we are entitled to say by our Western tradition, that religion simply means every human concern with a personal God, with a God who thinks and wills, and is concerned with men, with every man. Or, uh, to use the current uh, expression, a, a being who is a thou. As for the political philosophy mentioned in the title of the lecture, I have made its meaning sufficiently clear for our present purpose by speaking of the tradition of political philosophy. Political philosophy, I indicated, is something which is not precisely thriving in our age not in spite, but because of the fact that the word philosophy and political philosophy is used in our time, I believe, on every day more than it was ever used in the past. This is one of the characteristics of our time, just to illustrate a bit what it means, as the word historic is doubtless now used with great uh, prodigality. Every day we read of another historic event, and these events prove to be worthy of a headline today, but to be forgotten tomorrow, and at surely not later than next year. So in other words, we suffer from a kind of inflation regarding these words, and this applies to the word philosophy too. Inflation must not deceive us about the scarcity of the real stuff, and this applies to political philosophy as well. Yet, however absent political philosophy we may be from our age, all present-day discussions, for instance, of the question of religion and the common weal, are based, whether the discussants know it or not, on political philosophy. This is incidentally especially true of the so-called liberal position. The liberal position regarding this issue is surely not based on religion, Jewish or Christian, but on the unassisted human mind uh, alone, and hence on philosophy. Now, one thing one may say, while being reasonably certain that it will be permitted to pass by everyone, is this. Political philosophy emerged in Greece, and the classical document of Greek political philosophy is Aristotle's politics. Let us then begin here. What do we learn from Aristotle on our subject? Somewhere in the seventh book of the politics, he enumerates the functions, the works, essential to the common weal. 
mention six of them in ascending order from food below to government at the top. And in this admiration there occurs the following strange expression. Fifth and first, the concern regarding the divine. What does he mean by that? In the first place he means no common wheel or city is possible without religion, without established religion. A state religion obligatory on all citizens. In the sole remark which Aristotle makes in his own name on natural rights, he indicates that sacrificing to the God, and hence of course also praying, belongs to natural right. It is by nature just that the citizen pray and sacrifice. Every society must have this concern with, with the divine as a public political concern. Now this concern is the first, in a way, as I said, fifth and the first. It is the first because it is more necessary even than food, and at the same time it is higher even than the government. But in another respect, it is not the first, and therefore he says fifth or first. The divine in itself is surely higher than anything human. But what Aristotle speaks here of the political concern with the divine, this is not the highest. This political concern with the divine is something radically distinguished from knowledge of the divine. And knowledge of the divine would be, according to Aristotle, the highest human pursuit. This kind of concern, the political kind of concern, is neither the highest nor is it the most fundamental. Aristotle explains this in a passage of his of the Metaphysics, twelfth book, very famous in the Middle Ages. In the, middle, in the Latin Middle Ages, quoted Muhammad at the beginning, the opinion of the Father. The opinion, uh, the opinion of the Father. Now, what does he say there? He speaks there of the popular notions <coughs> regarding the gods which underlie public established religion. These popular notions contain an element of truth, but they are not completely true. Something untrue is added to them. Why? Quote, for the persuasion of the many and for use in regard to the laws and to the useful, i.e. the politically useful. End of the quotation. The laws need, in a sense, superhuman support, the ordinary political laws. Laws, as Aristotle understands them, cannot be simply rational or reasonable, because a simply rational or reasonable does not have a great force. The reasonable is powerful in the arts, in medicine, shoemaking, uh, uh, strategy, or what have you, but it is not uh, in regarding laws. Laws owe their validity decisively to custom, to habituation, not to their intrinsic rationality. And therefore they need another support, a superhuman support. Religion, in a word, if we translate Aristotle's terms, the concern with the divine by religion, as we may, religion is civil religion, political religion, a part of the political establishment. We can also use another term, not occurring in Aristotle, but somewhat later. We can say there is a civil theology as distinguished from the true philosophic theology. This term is best known from a quotation in Augustine, traced to some Stoics, but the thought is of course clearly in Aristotle. 
Now this view is not peculiar to Alistair. I mentioned a few points. Plato. Everyone knows the thesis of Plato's Republic, the rule of philosophy, the three conditions for public happiness. But if you read this in the context of the sequel of the Republic, the dialogue called Timaeus, you see that the rule of philosophers takes the place not simply of the rule of the people or of the arist aristocrats or of the kings, but especially it, uh, it takes the place of the rule of priests. The, the rule of philosophy is, is where the only adequate answer to the rule of the priests. I will now only assert that something of this kind, religion as civil religion, is a teaching of all classical philosophers. The example is the famous case of Socrates. Socrates was accused of having committed an unjust act by not worshipping the gods of the city. Now, what does it mean? Did he not bring the sacrifice or did not bring them in an orderly, law-prescribed manner? Plato's, ex uh, Plato's interpretation of the charge is this. Socrates did not believe that the gods worshipped by the city, city of Athens exist. This is infinitely graver than uh, to omit occasionally a, a sacrifice, as he admits having omitted uh, at the end of his life, when he says to Crichton, we have forgotten to bring a sacrifice to Asclepius. You know, this was not quite orthodox, and he gave this as a last injunction to his friend, bring that sacrifice uh, uh, tomorrow. Surely Socrates did not preach that the gods worshipped at the city of Athens do not exist. But which is much graver, in his famous apology, he does not meet that charge. When you read it, you see he, refu he doesn't refute it, he lays a trap for the accuser. And the accuser, a fool, goes into the trap and then so that it is out of all the difficulties. But it is surely not a refutation of the charge. So that is somehow claims, of course, that he is not guilty as charged, and that he is in, in various by implication after he's condemned, that he is innocently condemned. But this is a somewhat queer story when someone, a very enthusiastic admirer of Socrates, says, uh, "How terrible Socrates that you have been unjustly condemned." Socrates laughed, the only time he ever laughed, and says, would you prefer that I were justly condemned? <laughs> <laughs> but there can be no question, if you read the evidence, that he was guilty as charged. <laughs> now, he cannot deny to the police, to the city, the right to demand that every citizen believes in the existence of Zeus, Hera, and the whole lot. He has only, makes only one reservation, that he would refuse to obey the city. Even if the city would enact legally a law forbidding philosophizing, he says he would disobey that law. But such a law was not in existence, and would probably never have been enacted in these terms. What he does not say, of course, is to speak about is a connection between a prohibition against philosophizing and a prohibition against not believing in the existence of the gods worshipped by the city of Earth. He goes so far in the apology to say that his philosophizing is due to a straight command of a god, of Apollo who had commanded him to philosophize. Now again, if you read it, you see that Apollo didn't do anything of this kind. He simply said, gave the ambiguous question when he was asked by an enthusiast, an other enthusiastic admirer of Socrates, is anyone wiser than Socrates? 
Apollo or the priestess said, no. No one is wiser than Socrates, which of course is not exactly a command. Socrates, you must philosophize. Socrates interpreted it to mean that he is wiser than the others, according to the God, because he knows that he knows nothing. And therefore, in order to convince himself and others, he goes around in Athens and shows up everyone who pretends to be wise. And uh, of course, that's not too difficult for him. He shows that this man who pretends to be wise is in fact very unwise. And then he gets very unpopular by that. And the end of it is the condemnation. But however large a view we may take of how oracles can be interpreted, it stretches the thing a bit to say that it was a clear injunction of Apollo. Now, Plato, after the experience of Socrates, made an honest effort to solve that problem shown by Socrates' fate. Namely, that he is a philosopher who, as, as such, cannot believe in the gods worshipped at the city of Athens. And philosophy and the city are incompatible. How can one make them compatible? Now, this is a great question, a problem which Plato solved in the Laws, especially in the tenth book, where he uh, shows what the proper legislation regarding religion would be, namely to demand from every citizen belief in those gods whose existence can be demonstrated as the existence of Zeus and so on can never be demonstrated. And these are what we may call the cosmic gods, meaning the heavenly bodies who Plato, which Plato thought were animate, animate beings. And in this better city of the laws, only this rational belief is demanded from every citizen and, of course, then also legally enforced. And Socrates could have been lived and died without any difficulty in such a city. The pun about the punishments for unbelief there is very complicated. They, one has first the impression that it's capital punishment in every case, but this is not quite true because if a man is just, has led a just life and is not orthodox along the lines of this rational religion, uh, he will not be condemned to death, it's made clear later on. This much about Aristotle and Plato. But someone could say, but in all cases there must be a public religion, which every citizen must accept. But one could say, were there no radicals in classical antiquity? Liberals, as some people say. Now, there are quite a few people today who assert that, and they refer to such people as Protagoras, who, of course, was not an Athenian citizen, but who, who lived in Athens for a while and uh, got into troubles because his book began roughly with a sentence, whether the gods are or are not, I do not know. The difficulty or the remoteness of the subject matter and the brevity of my life prevents me from finding out the truth. And he has been called an agnostic, because he didn't formally deny, but only expressed his doubt. But one must also say, there is such people, there are many more. But neither Protagoras nor any other man of whom we know something engaged in propagating this view. These were people who, in very private circles of refined society, said these things, and perhaps also, in, and to some extent, also in writing. But we have only fragments of these writings. We don't know how that thing looked it's in the whole book. You know, it's always dangerous to judge on the basis of fragments. There's a view posted in our age by some Marxist and crypto-Marxist authors that the lines were roughly drawn in, in antiquity as in our time, a right and a left, and the right were these uh, 
curved fellows, so that they, they don't Aristotle, the reactionaries, and the left were the precursors of John Dewey. Uh, this is uh, just, uh, I mean, a, a piece of fiction which has no basis. The, the, the clear, uh, a very clear statement um, by Edmund Burke will help to clarify the situation. Burke said somewhere, boldness formerly was not the character of atheists as such. They were even of a character nearly the reverse. They were formerly like the old Epicurean, rather an unenterprising race. But of late they are grown active, designing, turbulent and seditious. Unquote. These old uh, irreligious people were not an enterprising race. They were sometimes uh, what we now call intellectuals, and in other cases, a kind of bums living at the marginal society, but that, that had no political importance. We can safely say that the political philosophy which exists in classical antiquity is that of men like Sugar, Spadon, Aristotle, and Stoics. The other people who could be regarded as precursors of modern liberalism uh, were not politically interested. There was not a ghost of a chance of a hope that this kind of thought could become politically relevant. Good. Now let me summarize then this point. No religion, I mean, if I, as a view uh, which Aristotle implies, and where, uh, which Aristotle and Plato and the others imply, and where, please understand me, I take now religion in the precise sense as a translation of what Aristotle means by the concern with the divine as a fifth and first, furthermore. Uh, but one must be somehow precise. I have people uh, heard uh, saying in this country, uh, well, I am a religious man, I'm a scientist. Well, if you call any dedication religion, then of course one can say every dedicated man is religious, but I think it is a gross misuse of word. Now, if I state then the view of uh, the classics as uh, coherently, I would say this. No religion is true. But some religion, any religion, is politically necessary. <clears throat> Law and morality are insufficient for the large majority of men. Obedience to the law and to the moral rules are insufficient for making men happy. Well, the well-known fact that the wicked are happy and the just live in misery. Law and morality are therefore in need of being supplemented by divine rewards and punishments. The true supplement to law and morality is, however, philosophy. But philosophy is essentially the preserve of very few men, because a special nature is required for becoming a philosopher. Religion is here, not to, meant to be the work of philosophers. None of these philosophers believed that he could found a religion. Religion is a work of the founders or legislators. And philosophy simply finds that and has to accept it. Yet philosophy can and should affect or modify religion. While it is indispensable to the city, re religion also creates certain dangers to the city. Famous cases, earthquakes and eclipses, interpreted as bad omina, panics in the army. Well, what do you do if you have an enlightened general? Like Pericles, like Scipio, he will give a brief lecture to the army and tell you that it has happened perfectly naturally and there is no omen in it. So our interesting question, first book of, the, of Cicero's Republic, is the most coherent discussion of that. Or another case, the famous naval battle of the Agi Musai, which the Athenians won, but where the generals or admirals 
didn't take care of picking up not the shipwrecked soldiers, but the corpses. Now, according to the Athenian uh, religious notion, the corpses have to be brought home to be buried properly. And the generals were condemned to death. Now, here there was another case where, from the philosopher's point of view, some information about the irrelevant of the mere corpse, as it is given, for example, in Plato's Phaedo, would have been helpful uh, in the, for the sake of humanity. And uh, forgive me if I mention also an example from Jewish history. No fighting on Sabbath. You know, the, at the beginning of the, of the Maccabean War, no fighting on Sabbath, and then it simply had to be changed because it proved to be impossible. Another example which goes through the ages, from Christian antiquity on, the institution of religious asylum. Someone going to touch an altar, a murderer, is protected by this very fact. An irrational practice which must be changed. The most urgent and famous question today of this nature is, of course, a question of birth control, as you all know. The position in this respect of the philosopher was clearly indicated by the Jewish the pious poet, Yehuda Levi, who said that the philosophers, in contradistinction to religion, or Judaism in particular, do not recognize a single rule of action, of conduct, which is universally valid. In other words, when the common good is in danger, there is no rule which cannot be disregarded. Now, what was the actual influence of philosophy and religion uh, in this respect? Well, one can say there was a fairly liberal religious practice, for example, in Athens for some time, and that had to do with the fact that Pericles was under the influence of men like Anaxagoras, a philosopher, and other cases. There was also a very liberal practice in the Roman Empire to some extent. But this liberal practice is one thing, and legal protection is another thing. So if we are concerned with legal protection, we must say classical antiquity was radically illiberal, philosophic or no philosophic. There was no nothing corresponding to the First Amendment. No freedom of religion was recognized in theory or in practice. To repeat what happened was, in certain cities for certain periods, a, a very liberal practice because uh, easygoing people. But when it came to a test, uh, this liberalism could not be defended. You know, the danger from this point of view was not that religion that the police represses religious freedom. This they did not even desire, but that uh, the, the undue influence of religion or priests on the city. Is this they were seriously concerned? But they didn't demand in any way freedom of religion. Religious repression, or positively stated, religious uniformity, is a need. The true concern with the divine is knowledge in the contradistinction to prayer and sacrifice. And the basis of that is, uh, to elaborate one point I indicated before, the fundamental human fact, so to speak, is a gulf between the philosophers and the non-philosophers, whom they call the demos, the common people. The very end of the philosophers and the non-philosophers differ. And therefore, the freedom which the philosophers can have cannot be had by anybody else. But there is a point of which is not altogether unimportant. The philosophers recognize the existence of an intermediate group between the philosophers and the demons, and these are the people whom they call the educated people, people who had listen to philosophers, they have come under their influence. 
in more social terms, the gentleman. A gentleman meant here an urban patrician. According to the Orthodox uh, doctrine, the urban patrician had to derive its livelihood from agriculture. But as a matter of fact, it was largely commercial. And I think that the history of philosophy, viewed from the point of view of mere sociology of philosophy, is to a large extent the history of a commercial patriciate. This, I think, goes until the 18th century. This was the social basis of philosophy, as they understood. Now, I must, have, must now, it's absolutely necessary that I say a word on what I will call, I have called, political theology. Now, by political theology, I mean teachings based on divine revelation, like the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and perhaps others. And according, from the point of view of any form of political theology, one particular religion is the true religion, whereas from the point of view of the philosophers, no religion is the true religion. Let us look for one moment at the difference between the three universal monotheistic religions. Uh, Judaism does not demand from all men that they become Jews, as you know, only those born from a Jewish mother. Christianity demands Christianity, in principle, from all men, but tolerates Jews with great disability. I'm speaking now, of course, of situation up to about 200 years ago. Islam tolerates Jews and Christians with considerable civil disabilities. Now, this had, of course, to do with the fact that the Christians recognize the Mosaic revelation and the Muslims recognize the Jewish and Christian revelation, although they do not recognize the, the books. Now, does the Jewish position entail recognition of a right to be irreligious? This, I believe, is a question which we must raise with a view to the burning question of our time. I would say no. The basis of traditional Jewish toleration, or, or, or however we might call it, is the famous sentence that the pious among the, or the righteous, as people say, the righteous among the nations of the world, i.e. among the non-Jews, have a share in the world to come, which in uh, Christian language they will be saved. Yeah, but righteous is the word, is the pious. It goes without saying that it's simply understood that these righteous men will, of course, believe in God. Maimonides, uh, who is uh, generally regarded as the greatest Jewish authority in post-Talmudic times, limits this high position to non-Jews who recognize and perform the so-called seven Noachidic commandments, the commandments uh, which were already given in the, um, according to the Bible, <laughs> And not later than Noah's time, and uh, Noah's, as they say, after the deluge, immediately after the deluge. And uh, they uh, include such prohibitions against murder and theft and so on, and of course also against idolatry. But Maimonides limits uh, this uh, toleration to non-Jews who recognize and perform these seven Noahidic commandments, on the basis of the Mosaic revelation. That is to say, anyone who abstains from these actions because uh, he is by, uh, has a natural inclination to that abstention, or because his reason has led him to abstain from them, does not belong, according to Mamunis, to these pious among the Gentiles. In practical terms, that means Maimonides limits this uh, toleration to Christians and Muslims, because they, of course, by definition, recognize the Mosaic revelation. 
pagans are excluded, and this creates some problem because one of the pagans was Aristotle, whom Maimonides admired very highly. In the discussion about this uh, decision of Maimonides, which became more and more shocking, the more the modern liberal notions prevailed within Judaism, a defender of the Maimonides in the older view quoted from the ninth psalm the verses which I may read in English translation. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. Arise, O Lord, let no man prevail, let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Now, the difficulty, I must mention one point because this is, becomes important later on. On the basis of political theology, in contradistinction to political philosophy, the, there is this fundamental difficulty. What is better, no religion or a false religion? I, should, I mean, given the fact that there will be people who will not have the true religion, what, and what is better? In other words, what is better or worse? Atheism or a living faith in a beast like Moloch? Because faith in Moloch is, of course, religion of the sort, and atheism clearly is not. The true religion is known as such only by revelation, not by reason or nature, and therefore there cannot be a natural obligation to worship and to love God, the true God. This is recognized by Thomas Aquinas, not reason simply, but reason informed by faith teaches that God is to be loved and worshipped. This means that deviating from Aristotle, and deviating because for, for Thomas Aquinas is the true religion, Thomas teaches that divine worship is not, strictly speaking, an institute of natural right. For natural theology, i.e. the natural knowledge of God's existence and so on, does not lead to the insight that God alone must be worshipped, which is, of course, the principle of Christianity as it is of Judaism and Islam. Now, natural theology does not lead to the insight that God alone must be worshipped, because uh, the alternative being the Aristotelian view, the belief in the eternity of the world, and on this basis the heavenly bodies, for example, are eternal and therefore can be legitimately be called God, as they are called by Aristotle, and then there is no reason why they shouldn't be worshipped. This much, is, uh, I think, is clear. Now, let me continue uh, with my theme problem. Freedom of religion as a right, as it is recognized in the First Amendment, is something specifically modern especially in that interpretation, according to which freedom of religion includes the freedom for, of irreligion. And this is, I think, the only interesting case. But someone can say, is not freedom of religion in the widest sense simply the right of the conscience, which includes the right of the erring conscience, uh, and therefore also in principle of the atheist. Uh, this is a, a Christian view, to which I have to say first that conscience is not a philosophic conception, but stems from Christian theology, at least in this meaning. Hence this line of thought does not belong to the tradition of political philosophy. Secondly, however, I believe that freedom of the erring conscience is not freedom for any false religion. I mean, the false religion is, the, is that the erring conscience is excused doesn't mean that the man of the erring conscience has a full legal right to, for example, to propagate 
if false teaching, we also cannot entirely divorce the ecclesiastical uh, teaching according to which the erring conscience binds. It binds. It doesn't give rise from consideration of the ecclesiastical practice. One can say, however, that freedom of religion is an indirect consequence of the Reformation. The whole story with which you are familiar since your school, since your great school days, the Reformation, the religious wars, the ruin of Europe, the desire to stop that bloodshed and the devastation, tolerance. There is no question about this historical concatenation. And one must also mention that there were certain sects, Christian sects, from the very beginning of the Reformation who were in favor of toleration. But again I say, and that is not merely a verbal excuse, this is not political philosophy. These sectarians who wanted a freedom of religion on the basis of of certain Christian notions of the conscience and of faith, since we are surely not philosophers. However, prior to the Reformation, or at any rate independently of it, certain modifications of classical political philosophy occurred within political philosophy. I mentioned two names. The first is Sir Thomas More, Utopia, which is written fundamentally from a philosophical point of view, published 1516, that is a one year before the outbreak of the Reformation. Now, in this perfect commonwealth, the Utopia, which is described there, the established, there is an established religion. The established religion is, however, the natural or rational religion, something which Plato had somehow hinted at in the laws. But everyone is free to add to it of its own. For example, if he of his own, for example, if he thinks he should worship, say, Mercury, the star Mercury, in addition to the one cause of everything, is perfectly free to do so. No one can be persecuted on account of his religion. Everyone may follow the religion which he likes, except said no one who doesn't believe in the immortality of the souls and in providence can be a citizen. This is the absolute limit. So there is an established religion. No one may defend his religious views differing from the accepted views in public, but he may defend it before priests and serious men, grave men, very grave. But again, there is no punishment for infringement. The public cult is uniform, but does not violate anything peculiar to anyone's private religion. For example, no prayer which everyone could not speak. That I think you are reminded of many contemporary facts by that very interesting, 1516. In brief, a society united in and by the true religion of reason. It tolerates additions to it, but no subtraction. The contemporary of Moore, who also made a considerable change in the traditional doctrine, was Machiavelli, who in his two great books, which were written at about the same time as Utopia was. I mention only one point, the only point of epoch-making importance. Machiavelli teaches that a public religion is indispensable, as everyone else had taught before him, but he makes this qualification for republics, not in absolute monarchy. There the strong arm of the prince can supply what religion otherwise gives. So is this is a kind of inkling of the so-called enlightened despotism of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. I do not know of any suggestion of this kind from earlier literature. But I keep in mind, and let us keep in mind the implication of Machiavelli. 
while an irreligious, absolute monarchy, despotism may be possible, an irreligious republic is not. Now, the change which was effected by Machiavelli and the man who in these matters is his successor, surely Hobbes, is fundamental because it concerns the relation of philosophy and the common weal. I must unfortunately say a few words about that. The change is brief, consists in two elements. Hey, do I have 20 minutes? Yes, sir. The first is this. Science is for the sake of power. Science is not, and science means always philosophy, that's not different at this time. Uh, science is not for its own sake, but for the sake of power, for the relief of man's estate, as someone called it. That implies that from now on, the end of the ultimate end of the philosopher and the end of the non-philosophers are the same. There is no longer that gulf which is ex existed in classical times. And the formula for that end is, I think, the best which was ever point was Locke's formulation, comfortable self-preservation. The second difference, the common people, the non-philosophers, can become enlightened. The philosophic, scientific teaching does no longer remain a preserve of a so-called intellectual elite, but is threat, is broadcast and transforms the whole citizen body. Science becomes for the first time a public power. It becomes a public power because it, it, it forms the mind of large masses of men. Now, what is the situation of a problem in this stage? Hobbes, uh, whose construction is still the, the clearest and most lucid in existence, Hobbes starts from a very massive fact, which has very much to do with toleration, namely uh, fear of violent death, because persecution naturally culminates in killing people. Violent death is the greatest evil, and this must be avoided by government, i.e., Peace at all costs is a fundamental condition. And this, of course, requires strong government. I mean, whenever government is divided, uh, there will be all kinds of friction, uh, legal delays, and so on. Unqualified sovereignty. And he preferred monarchy, i.e. absolute monarchy. Religion owes its legal power only to the uncontrolled and uncontrollable act of the sovereign. Say, if Christianity is an established religion in England that is due to an act of uh, British kings or kings in parliament and not to any intrinsic truth which it might have. The, king, the sovereign can determine which religion is to be established as he sees fit. This means, of course, also he can disestablish it, as he sees fit. The Christian is obliged in conscience to commit idolaters and uh, idolatrous and blasphemous acts if his sovereign so commands, because obedience to the sovereign is the fundamental duty. And now comes the interesting turn. The sovereign may establish or disestablish any religion he pleases, but he is not obliged to establish any religion, any public worship, which as such would be uniform. He may, as Hobbes puts it, allow many sorts of worship. Many sorts of worship. In that case, however, it goes on, and that's extremely interesting, it cannot be said that the Commonwealth is of any religion at all. End of the quotation. 
Why? Because there is no public religion, no established religion. The consequence is that Hobbes admits at this passage, a, a unique passage in this work, but an important one, that an irreligious commonwealth is possible. Or to state it quite bluntly, an atheistic society is possible. This is one of the greatest events in the history of our problem. Three years after Hobbes' death, a French writer, Pierre Bell, published a book, Pensée divers, divers thoughts on a certain comet which had appeared, and which is spelled out what in Hobbes is only once mentioned. I must say a few words about this work, which I think is one of the most important works in this whole development. It opposes the belief that comets are uh, omen, a belief still very strong in the 17th century, but an issue which we would all regard as extremely trivial. Now he gives eight reasons why comets are not the, the fairly large book, the four on the page. Yes, yes. There are thoughts on a certain comet which had appeared and which spells out what in Hobbes is only once mentioned. I must say a few words about this work, which I think is one of the most important works in this whole development. Bell opposes the belief that comets are omen, a belief still very strong in the 17th century, but an issue which we would all regard as extremely trivial. Now he gives eight reasons why comets are not the, the fairly large book, book four hundred on the page. Eight reasons. The seventh reason is a theological reason, and the only theological reason which he adduces against the belief in the comet. He argues as follows If comets were evil omens, God would have made miracles in order to confirm idolatry. If they are omens, if they say something, then they are not merely natural events, they are miracles. And since comets were used in pagan antiquity and in China for idolatrous purposes, God had come, um, uh, you see, that is a very neat piece of theological reasoning, then God would have made miracles in order to confirm idolatry. But then here comes an objection, that God might very well have confirmed idolatry, because it is a lesser evil than atheism, that the Greeks or the Chinese are uh, idolaters, it's better than they are atheists. And then the response to this objection is the following, Bale's response. In the nice, atheism is, is not necessarily such an evil. Atheism does not necessarily lead to immorality. And in this connection he does something. He proves, or he attempts to prove, the possibility of an atheistic society at an enormous depth. Atheism is altogether innocent. I can't suppress mentioning his theological argument proper, which is taken from the analogy of human jealousy, because, you know, opposed to idolatry, God's jealousy. He says a husband is less jealous if his wife does not love any man, including himself, than if she loves an other man. <laughs> and uh, according, you know, he uses the old uh, principle of analogy uh, for his uh, very novel purpose. Mm. Now, this epoch-making event, <coughs> which is connected with the names of Hobbes and Bale, remained, however, subterraneous and did not in any way affect public policy or public discussions until the 19th century, when an open atheistic propagation by, by, by the, an, an, with a political or social purpose came into the open, especially, of course, in socialism and uh, communism. 
But something took place, say, between 1670, roughly, and the French Revolution, which met the eye, and the grounds of which were not discerned by everyone, but the, the men who were responsible for it knew it rather very well. In other words, that part of the iceberg, which became visible, was a technique, the technique of the enlightenment of these philosophers, Two rules, multiply sects and uh, deflect the attention of men from the otherworldly goal to this worldly goal. The empirical basis, the Dutch Republic, which was the model, regarded as the model, because religious tolerance Every sect can has freedom in, in Holland, and they are getting richer and richer, whereas the Spanish monarchy gets poorer and poorer from day to day. So there is a connection, a connection between these two things. Yeah, multiplication of sects plus economic, you can say. That was a technique of these men who steered this big a conspiracy, I think, as we can say, of the late 17th century and the 18th century. Now, the great political philosophers of that age, of the 17th, 18th century, apart from Hobbes, do, of course, not go so far as Hobbes and Bale do. I mentioned these three names. Locke, famous fighter for tolerance. But severe limitation. Surely no tolerance for atheists, explicitly. In his case, not even for Catholics. Well, that had, of course, to do with the British uh, uh, settlement. Spinoza, a state religion in a republic, absolutely necessary. The state religion must be based on either the Old Testament or the Old and New Testament taken together so that Jews and Christians are all right. Naturally, he gives an extremely great freedom to, of interpretation. For example, everyone must believe that God exists, but he may just say, well, matter is God. And then he, uh, he complies. In other words, it, it is almost zero, but still, legally, no toleration. Where is it? That's important. And the last great uh, man of this tradition, Rousseau, who, as everyone knows, uh, demanded a civil religion, uh, absolutely necessary, and he has been accused uh, by some people who know <coughs> him prior to Rousseau, and know only 19th century liberalism, that he was a terrible totalitarian, and I don't know what, whereas he was, in this respect, only the last relic, so to say, of the older view. Good. So, is, in other words, in this great period, formative period of modern time, there is a considerable modification of the overall understanding, but clearly no, univer no freedom of irreligion. Tolerance means, for all practical terms, tolerance for every religion, but not for any irreligion. I believe one has to take this into account if one wants to understand the First Amendment, because the First Amendment and the American Constitution altogether is, after all, a product of the 18th century, and the or great authorities there, philosophic authorities, are all member, men of the 18th century. I believe one has to consider this very seriously. The question what all individuals responsible for the Constitution for the Federalist Papers, but for the Constitution as a whole, thought privately is utterly uninteresting. The point is what they could publicly defend. This would have to be considered. I, now, of course, in the 19th century, it seems, freedom became unlimited. Unlimited. And this is a tradition to which people defer. Now, let us look for one moment as the greatest representative of free libertarianism in the 19th century. And that is, as I believe everyone would admit, John Stuart Mill. 
But let us not look at of liberty, let us look at his autobiography. I must bore you with a few quotations. I was brought up from the first without any religious belief in the ordinary acceptation of the term. My father, educated in the creed of Scotch Presbyterianism, had by his own studies and reflection been early led to reject not only the belief in revelation, but the foundation of what is commonly called natural religion. His father's aversion to religion in the sense usually attached to the term, do you see the heading? I'm not simply irreligious, only in religious in the sense usually attached to the term, <laughs> was of the same kind as that, as that of Lucretius. He regarded with the feelings due not to a mere mental delusion, but to a great moral evil. He looked upon it as the greatest enemy of morality. I am thus one of the very few examples in this country of one who has not thrown off religious belief, but never had it. <laughs> I grew up in a negative state with regard to it. Yeah, obviously, even in England, he will not be so rare today. At this point in my early education had, however, incidentally, one bad consequence, deserving notice. In giving me an opinion contrary to that of the world, my father thought it necessary to give it as one which could not prudently be avowed to the world. This lesson of keeping my thoughts to myself at that early age was attended with some moral disadvantages. One more point and then I'm through with this quotation, and almost through with my lecture. Uh, yeah, well, he, when he was running for parliament, much later, a well-known literary man was heard to say that the Almighty himself would have no chance of being elected on such a program as that on which he ran. I strictly <laughs> adhere to it, neither spending money nor canvassing, nor did I take any personal part in the election until about a week preceding the day of nomination, when I attended a few public meetings to state my principles and give answers to any questions which the electors might exercise their just right of putting to me for their own guidance. Answers as plain and unreserved as my address. On one subject only, my religious opinion, I announced from the beginning that I would answer no question, a determination which appeared to be completely approved by those who attended the meeting. <laughs> really interesting how freedom, the freedom of religion, or from religion rather, which Mill exercised as distinguished from what he demanded in his of liberty, was still along the lines of Locke, Spinoza, and uh, Rousseau, rather than of John Dewey. I'll summarize that one. What is the issue? The issue seems to be this. Does the Commonwealth require religion for its well-being, and may it therefore legitimately demand from every citizen that he has some religion? i.e. that he believes in God, or can an atheistic society be a good society? I would like to define atheistic society, lest there be any uh, doubt. A an atheistic, of course, there is no society in which all members are atheists. An atheistic society is a society in which no public governmental act and no publicly supported act has any reference whatever to God. This is a clear case in the USSR. Or in which no man suffers from any politically relevant disability, as distinguished from mere legal disability, on the ground of his professed atheism. 
What is uppermost in our minds is a question, a question of American constitutional law, namely the correct interpretation of the First Amendment. Does the freedom of religion mean freedom for all religions, but only for them, or does it give an equal freedom from all religion? I believe that it is impossible to settle this legal question of utmost gravity if one does not settle first the theoretical question, and namely this theoretical question, which I, the discussion of which we have begun tonight. So, this is sorry. <laughs> and just uh, not uh, standing on ceremony, he or she who has a ready question indicates so by, <laughs> by and it means short of fire crackers. <laughs> This is a very complicated question, but I believe it is not the first question. The first question is a recital, and that is the question that one must really have before one's mind eye, eyes, as atheistic society is defined, and a non-atheistic society. And say, let it be, we of course we take a a non atheistic society as we wish it, not necessarily one model in the past which uh, may have been defective in, on a thousand grounds. Yeah? That is the question. And then the question of whether any law, legal compulsion is of any use is an entirely different. But there are, for example, in this question, in the famous case which, of which I do not wish to touch, being not a trained constitutional lawyer. I mean, the, the, the players in, yeah, in public school, this is an example of, of what the practical is. Yeah. You see, I mean, it was an, or a maxim of wise men of the past that legislation can only follow a certain state of preparedness of public opinion. By public opinion, I don't mean what the Gullapol that means, but the settled conviction, not necessarily coming out in questionnaires on which people have literally asked. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it, it, it would seem to be. It would seem to be a. Uh, uh, it would seem to be desirable if, if, uh, uh, to support religion publicly. If that, uh, and uh, you would. Working on that premise, of the the gravity of the question would depend on uh, the question. Well, the gravity of the issue of whether religion should uh, be publicly supported or not depends in part on the uh, effectiveness of, of public support of religion. And there are many people who would deny that a uh, school prayer or something of this sort. And yes, it really on the training of children when there's Yeah, that other. is extremely, of course, how and these things cannot be weighed. They cannot be measured. No one can know what a certain phrase, heard, drowsy, stated drowsily, repeated drowsily, but remembered in a key moment of one's life would mean. Now, if this phrase was never heard, it will not be remembered. 
Even Stalin remembered in a conversation with Churchill, I remember, when he spoke of one of the great war situations, yeah? and he said something of this God's help. So he, of course, had gone even to the Greek seminar, and so he had uh, more of an author with a little education. But uh, you, you know what I mean. I'm uh, speaking now not exactly of a meaning of habitual and thoughtless use, but at a certain moment. If such an uh, expression, any other, I don't want to uh, do that, but I think I apply to the imagination of every one of you. That is un unfathomable, unpredictable. Because these are all seeds. And whether the seeds will go up depends uh, not only on the soil, also on the weather. Yeah? And how, who can know that? I believe that all these methods, the quantitative methods, I don't, uh, I don't make the thing allowance for this. The steps, and so they even have now I hear depth interview. <laughs> but this depth is of course a relative depth, maybe what depth psychology means by depth. Hmm? It may not be true depth. So that one cannot say. I think what one must face first the question, first this question whether whether uh, I, I know there are people who would say if there were no religion whatever anymore, yeah, anymore, no no one would go to any any uh, uh, synagogue or church and no one would ever pray and no one and uh, blast birds and wedding and uh, burial would be on the, yeah, would be a relief for the world. I'm sure that Lord Rutter came with that along these lines, and he's not the only one. Quite a few people. But all right, but one must really figure it out. Yeah. One must uh, look, uh, look at it detachedly and soberly. How would this be? How would this affect human beings? And all kinds of human beings. And the other way, what is, and if this is not a desirable thing, if this is not a desirable thing, then one must see, well, uh, uh, how can one, what can one do? Is it, is it possible that any governmental action, the provided then, not necessarily legal action, you know, there are also certain things which are simply done in 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 uh, statements by leading statesmen and so on. Uh, uh, what what uh, uh, could be done? What could be demanded? And it has uh, it, it would have the decision either way has effect in unexpected quarter, unexpected quarter. And uh, that uh, I would say is a primary question. I do not, it's, it's the question which raises of immense practical importance, but as all practical questions, it presupposes somehow a theoretical decision. Mr. Wright. To ask what is perhaps the other half of that gentleman's question, what, where would the area of the greatest expense and cost be, taking seriously, of re-establishing a state-established religion, believing in a providential God. <coughs> you know, the established religion, I mean, a religion is a strict sense, as to mean it when you speak of established, a means of course a particular religion, uh, to mention the two examples in this country, Chris, uh, Christianity and Judaism, okay? because I think we can disregard Islam, in spite of the black Muslims. Yeah. No, I didn't mean, I didn't mean putting Cardinal Spellman in the White House, but something milder, taking, uh, we already have in God we trust in the current yeah, yeah. thing. Well, God is known to be man, and by religious people, uh, one yeah, of the the God. But, uh, uh, re uh, reversing the trend away from the prayers in the public functions to make it uh, is that politically impossible for people to succeed in public life without avowing a trust in a providential God. 
but uh, some have called the first church choice, first church of your choice religion. Yeah, but still, it, whatever this may be, I mean, if it is a religion, it should be believed in the God, isn't it? And the question is really is not the question of the establishment of any particular religion. It's the question of the uh, is the question of to what extent there is I think the simplest statement of the problem is to say freedom to the state is does the first amendment mean freedom for all religion or freedom from religion? Or does it also include freedom from religion? That's the question. Now that uh, this of course there is the other point which uh, I should be good with the money from Mr. Vestalo. Even admitting that it means only freedom for religion, what about the freedom of speech? Maybe the freedom of speech would protect irreligious speech as much as religious speech, and therefore it would be up against the criminal That is quite true. Yes. Uh, doctor, I wonder if uh, the once we accept the principle that uh, freedom of uh, religion, meaning freedom to practice any religion in a state. I wonder if perhaps... But, is that, by the way, some qualifications. Yes. Yeah. Mormons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But if they are trivial, we can, they are not the most practical forms now. All right. Now, I wonder, does the not imply that in the eyes of the state that one religion is as good as another? Of that. Yeah, I believe that in the moment that is abandoned, I believe the state would then cease to be a liberal state proper. I mean, that I believe is really meant, was meant from the very beginning. So there must not be any uh, identification of the state with any particular religion. Well, then if that's the case, doesn't it follow logically, or does it follow logically, then that freedom of religion implying that in the eyes of the state one religion is... Yeah, no. Another, does, it, does it not follow... No, because, I mean, the example, for example, of Thomas Moore, already prior to the modern development proper, shows that uh, there can be something which one can loosely call, but sufficiently... Um, precise for practical purpose, a rational, natural religion. You know, today people, if the term has become discredited, and today people speak of the Hebrew Christian tradition. Yeah? That is, in historical terms, roughly what this man meant. Perhaps uh, uh, the term naturally in the religion would also have included uh, in, uh, quite a few pagan, yeah, who did not share the Hebrew Christian tradition. And uh, uh, that, I think, is, uh, is the practical issue today. I believe no one has the intention of, of uh, um, establishing any religion, even Christianity in general, as, you know, as things from the difference between uh, Catholicism on the one hand and any Protestant variety on the other. This is not of the issue. Then, of course, I deliberately didn't go into a one very big question, which is not, uh, which indeed belongs to political, to a theoretical consideration, but not to the constitutional consideration. And that is whatever the law including the constitutional law, may say, the state of mind of the citizen uh, is uh, at least as important, you know? So that, uh, for example, in, in say, around in, in, the, in, in 1800, there could be no question that the overwhelming majority of American citizens were practicing Christians. Yeah, mm -hmm. while not legal, while not a legal fact was an immensely important political. Well, if you remember the last election, uh, there was even the, when the, for the first time a non-person became president of the United States. Then you know how how politically relevant the non-legal 
I mean, the not the illegal, but the non-legal side. Oh. I mean, that is, I believe, what political sociology is concerned with, you know. These kind of things which are not, do not appear in law, but are very powerful politically. This, and this I didn't go, which is, also, of course, would also concern. But I, I suppose that today, the fact that a considerable minority of the American people uh, is no longer either Christian or Jewish in any religiously relevant sense, uh, of course, has created this underlying present situation. I mean, I don't believe that you can state these things very clearly in statistical terms, but this is, I think, uh, the, the basis, yeah? Something again, a non-legal fact, non-legal fact, uh, as possible under the Constitution, as on the other case, that the whole population would adhere to one and the same particular religion, which is of course equally possible, legally. Yeah. And yet uh, it would give society an entirely different character than it has in the two cases. If one has surely to consider both possibilities. Uh, what one may call a religiously homogeneous liberal democracy and an atheistic religious democracy, a liberal democracy. Both are theoretically possible and vice to consider them. Although in fact I believe the liberal democracies are all in countries which are not religiously homogeneous. It's not true? Or, or did I forget anything? Surely in uh, Holland has a considerable Catholic minority. Uh, Britain has a smaller one, but on the other hand, a large variety of Protestant sects. And uh, where, where do you find? Scandinavia for the church. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, Name countries are very, so to speak, religiously homogeneous, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim. But very. They're almost gone. Yeah, but there, because a large part of the population is no longer to be a really Christian. Yeah. And one would have that would be an interesting object of study how this change occurred. You know, uh, not political change in the narrower sense of the term, but of course decisive for the character of the society. Yes. Oh no, this lady was, but I'm sorry. One theoretical difficulty would you see in the position that it's possible to have a well-ordered and then and um, viable society, which has uh, as its only public ethics uh, a system without which the obligation of which lies solely in strictly theological goals decided upon by the society at large, a uh, uh, strictly uh, uh, an ethics that is uh, only only good so long as the society can decide on certain goals and which would be changed if the goals were altered. But what kind of goals? Well... Calibalism? No, let us say that uh, a society were to form goals that are very much uh, similar to the goals that many people say our nation has got now. Um, so you say decent goals? Yes. Yeah, good. Oh, that's a great difference. All right, but let us assume decent goals. But then the question is this. Is the dedication of a society to decent goals, and I suppose also uh, of the serious part of the population, to it, otherwise society consists of individuals, is this sufficient, humanly sufficient? You doubtless have heard, and uh, probably know much more about it than I do, about uh, the fact that, uh, which is sometimes called insecurity, yeah? insecurity, which even decent people have, yeah? and uh, loneliness, yeah? you know, loneliness is kind of thing. Uh, so you, I think, in order to be realistic, you would have to say dedication to uh, to decent goals plus psychiatry. 
because psychiatry would then be the only way in which these problems of the individual, yeah, which are not solved by this dedication to these goals, would be solved. Now, the, the, that, I don't say that this is a complete picture, but I believe it is somewhat more complete than the one which you drew. A decent goal, say social, uh, say the welfare, socialism, or not, you know, a welfare state plus psychiatry. Is this we have to some extent? We are on the way to it, but again, the question is: Is this? Is this what? one can be satisfied with, would be the question. One would have to face that. Could one add that, that perhaps a, a public ethics based on mutual goals with the addition that uh, there is complete and total freedom to be both religious and irreligious in any sense? I couldn't hear the last part of it. Um, Adding also that one could have whatever religion privately one chose to one person. Yeah, but this is, I believe, not the question, because that is understood according to any interpretation of the First Amendment that the uh, uh, Constitution does not prescribe any individual which religion he has or she has. Yeah. This is... Uh, is uh, uh, it's not, no, there are other questions which are more subtle, into which I cannot go, there is a limit to every discussion. For example, there are people who say that Buddhism, for example, uh, strictly understood, is an atheistic religion. Yeah, I mean, in other words, it is not mere, uh, how shall I say, spiritual emptiness. But it is something spiritual, and yet it is atheistic, that I have heard. Now, is this phrase, it would, be, would, phrase, would have to be considered, this kind of thing. And especially, I hear there is now, in, in some circles in the United States, a great movement, that numerically probably not very strong, uh, in favor of Zen, Zen Buddhism. Have you heard of that? I have heard of it. And, uh, <laughs> so, and uh, so, I do not, but still, if one wants to have a complete picture, one must without. Uh, any fastidiousness taking into consideration all these kind of things. But let's do that. Uh, my focus was a very limited one to state what the fundamental issue is which one has to face if one wants to reach clarity about a seemingly purely legal constitutional law question. And uh, if I may repeat this once more, the interpretation of the Constitution, as I learned from a very thorough study uh, by Mr. Mastabro, which I had the pleasure to read, uh, it comes always up against the question, what was in the minds of the Founding Fathers? Now, this can be partly established, of course, by their explicit utterances. But since they were not, strictly speaking, theoretical men, uh, there one must uh, find out that, to some extent, by studying the theory to influence them. Uh, Locke is, of course, always mentioned in this connection, but perhaps others also have to consider. In brief, the state of political philosophy and its latitudes, which were limited, in the late 18th century. And uh, this is... Uh, you agree, don't you? Yeah. And this is uh, what I try to supply to some extent. Mr. Uh, what would be, if any, the grounds for reconciliation between the philosophical view that says no one religion is true and the religious view which says our religious view is the truth? No. Practical reconciliation, practical uh, forbearance, no theoretical. Uh, reconciliation, I believe. I mean, there are all kinds of things. For example, uh, well, take the perhaps the most famous case, Hegel, who said the philosophic system has shown the truth of the Christian dogma. But by this very fact, of course, he transformed the Christian dogma into a philosophic theorem, which was no longer, where all non-philosophic things were dismissed as, 
as uh, imaginate, merely imaginary irrelevancies, yeah? you know. And uh, as these of, uh, there are also Jews who have done the same thing. So, uh, but this is, I think, uh, conceals the issue. The older view, the simple older view, that there is natural reason and there is supranatural revelation, which of course would not be accepted by philosopher as supranatural or supranational, but yet by its virtue of the clear distinction keeps the least that life the problem and doesn't conceal it by a sham identification. Yes. As an extension of that uh, question, if the political philosophers are uh, in principle non believers, and if on the other hand he uh, somehow in principle has governing responsibilities in the society, doesn't his stance, so to speak, as a non believer point the way for, uh, for an atheistic society? Point? There's some kind of unbridgeable gap between the political and the... Yeah, well, that is a long question. In practice, all kinds of combinations are possible. But let us, you know, but this may very well be due to the human and all the human desire to eat the cake and have it. Uh, but if we speak now about a serious man, I mean, and men who take intellectual responsibility, I think that is perfectly clear that the philosopher, I mean, I refer you to Thomas Aquinas himself, the philosophy as philosophy is not dependent on faith. I mean, that is a kind of of fideistic view, yeah? uh, which uh, Pascal may have had in other people, but which surely is not, uh, surely not the Thomistic view. There is a sphere in which human reason uh, can exert itself, and, and all, and that is of course meant by the word philosophy or science, and political philosophy is a part of it. Now, the key question is, the key controversy is this, and uh, does, is the sphere of philosophy so essentially incomplete while being autonomous in itself, that it points towards its completion in revelation? And then, I, if I understand Thomas well, he says that's the case. It is incomplete and points towards its completion. Yeah, but to, by, but by by the fact that Thomas teaches that and acts on that teaching, also theoretically, he is a theologian who uses philosophy, and uh, um, is he he. Uh, he can, one can perhaps say he is a better philosopher than the, the other philosophers are. That is probably what you would say. But it is still something which is no longer possible on the basis of philosophy as such. And since even all proof of the defects of philosophy, yeah, the defectiveness of philosophy, are of no great help, if you do not get the supplement and since the supplement is accessible only on the basis of faith, yeah, it's a conclusion follows. Assuming that, assuming that you don't get this supplement, I, think I, got the, I got the impression from your lecture that you're suggesting that political philosophy as such implies non-belief. Thomistic Thomistic philosophy suggests that there is that it points to something more. Yeah, but as you don't philosophy... get that something more, and also assuming that the political philosopher has some governing responsibility to the community. Yeah, but he can fulfill that only on the basis of human reason. And I would say that, I believe that Thomas Aquinas would say that uh, uh, the guidance which political philosophy gives for the common weal uh, is uh, genuine guidance as far as it goes to me for this worldly end. 
But isn't that, won't that guidance necessarily be in conflict with the, with the civil religion, assuming the, assuming the political philosophy is a non-believer and this is a principle? Why should that be? I mean, after all, well, if you take even the doctrine of, of Rousseau, what does it amount to? Uh, that uh, are sanctions, superhuman sanctions for morality. The content of the morality is entirely determined by human race. I mean, I do not wish to, to uh, the, uh, the very contrary, I, 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 I would, um, wish to make as clear as possible that there are real questions there. But I would say these are the real questions, uh, not uh, some which are uh, um, ordinarily discussed. And I would like to add one point, which I said already at the beginning. I, you, some of you may have seen that I am not a hundred percent liberal. But the liberal position is today, at least in the Northern academic university, uh, academic service, almost omnipotent. Now, this position, the liberal position, surely, is based on the uh, on philosophy alone. I mean, they don't call it philosophy anymore. But if you use the uh, term uh, unassisted human mind alone. I mean, the social sciences are not in any way based on revelation in any sense. I believe that there is a universal agreement on this point. Yeah? And therefore, for this reason alone, I would have been compelled to take up the issue on this basis alone. Yeah? Uh, because otherwise one simply says, well, uh, well, uh, yeah, you have your beliefs, and uh, that is um, that are your private prejudices. These prejudices may be nice, or they may be obnoxious, but this has no sta standing in academic discussion. That you would hear. I believe she uh, there's someone there raised his hand or finger. No. Well, if we have exhausted the subject, <laughs> there is no reason why we should not have tea. <laughs> Good.